This morning, I want to speak to you on the subject, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Go to Romans 14th chapter, please. 14th chapter of Romans. We have services at 3 and 5. Uh, is it 6? 3 and 6. Uh, no repeat services. 3 and 6 o'clock. Romans 14, please. Verse 10, but why dost thou judge thy brother? Why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to me. So that every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Verse 10 is my text. Why dost thou judge thy brother? Why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have sent the Holy Spirit to Times Square Church in a unique way. And you have caused us to recognize the presence of Jesus as we've never known it before. And we walk softly before you, Lord. I've heard people just whisper. And walk out of this church with such a holy awe and reverence for you. In a time, Lord, when you are so lightly esteemed by the world and in so many places, you've come to call a people to reverence you, to walk in your holiness and righteousness. Oh, God, I pray that you speak again to us. Lord, we're not looking inside our own selves. We're letting you, the Holy Spirit, come and search us out. The searcher of all men's hearts has come to search us out to prepare a people, Lord. In a time when calamity is beginning to fall upon this land in such ferocity, and when the world is spinning out of control, you have promised to reveal yourself. If my people are called by my name, shall humble themselves, forsake their sin, confess and turn to you and pray, you would heal. And I pray, Lord, you do that in our hearts. Speak clearly to us by the power of your Holy Ghost. And we receive it as from you, Lord. You've started the work in my heart. Now, Lord, let it touch everyone listening to me today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. There's an awesome scene in the 20th chapter of Revelation. There's a great white throne pictured and God the Father sitting on the throne. And before him stands all the multitudes of the world from all creation, from the beginning of time. And the scripture makes it very clear that the Antichrist will be there in all of his forces, the false prophet. All the graves have been emptied. Hitler will be there. Stalin will be there. All the mass murderers will be there. Muhammad will be there. Every killer of babies will be there. Every atheist will be there. Every Christ rejecter will be there. And the Bible says also the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, all murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, all liars. A multitude, the Bible said, which no man could number. And on that day, the books are going to be opened, the Bible said, and whose name, whosoever's name is not written in the book of life to be cast into an eternal lake of fire. Whosoever... It was not written in the book of life shall be cast in outer darkness. Now, folks, there was a time that preaching like that, focusing on the day when we would stand before God and give an account, and warning about an eternal destruction for those who rejected Christ, there was a time, even in America, that that would move hearts. In the early revivals in the United States, especially in Kentucky and the Midwest, and even here in the state of New York, even in 1857, in that great revival that spread, and when it hit the Midwest especially, evangelists gave prophetic words about the coming of Jesus, and especially about the day when we stand to give an account of our sins. 
Every man must give an account of himself, the Bible says. And when that came down on the power and authority of the Word of God and the anointing of the Holy Spirit, men everywhere in camp meetings, by the hundreds and even by the thousands, bent their knee and wept and confessed and turned to the Lord. They were deeply moved by the Word and the warning of that coming judgment. Today, society is so warped by calamities and plagues and killer diseases we're so satiated with sensuality that this kind of preaching anymore doesn't move the crowd. It doesn't move the masses because it's just another disaster movie. It's just another Hollywood scene. They've seen so much. The mind has been so satiated. The mind has been so bombarded with disasters and with all of these calamities. Movies about Armageddon and the, even the coming of the Lord. The movie is called The Rapture. I've never seen any of these, but, but I read it in the paper about rapture and all of these things. So it's just another movie. And folks, even if an angel came down in the form of a man or a preacher, and it could be ascertained he was truly from another world and warned the way it's going to be and paint the picture so vividly, the majority of people, especially in the United States, would chuckle. Others would say, I'm standing before God, am I? I've got a lot of things on my mind to tell him. I'll tell him. This is the attitude today of mockery. Nothing moves this generation anymore in the way of preaching about judgment and the fear of God because we have lost the fear of God. This generation doesn't care anymore. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Why is it that when uh, almost a million people have lost their jobs in the last eight months, why are young people who don't even know if they're going to have a job tomorrow buying $500,000 houses? Not even know if they're able to pay it. Because they all tell us, well, we're all going to be in the same boat, so what? It's a no-care attitude. Now, folks, I myself can visualize some of those awful scenes of that day. Somewhere in eternity, we don't know, our minds can't comprehend it, but there's a place that God has prepared for a judgment when all the masses of the world from all time are going to be gathered before Him, and He on a white throne is going to open the books, and the angels will be there, and the multitudes will stand before Him to give an account. And what a day that will be. The Bible said there was no place for them to, to, to stand. In other words, they had no standing of their own. I don't know where that place is. There's no loudspeaker, but everyone will hear even a whisper. I don't understand, as far as the eye can see, an eternal picture that is beyond comprehension when everyone will give this account. I can picture those who Jesus spoke of, who said, Lord, Lord, we've done mighty things in your name. We've cast out devils. We healed the sick. And when they stand before him on that day, listing what they have done in his name, the Bible says, he will say to them, Depart from me, you work of iniquity. And he'll point to the angels and they'll be bound hand and foot and cast into outer darkness, screaming, I did it in your name. And I can picture that multitudes in that great host that are being judged, who are in the same position, who performed the same kind of miracles and said the same thing, knowing that judgment has already been pronounced. Can you imagine them knowing, those know what they are going to be told when they stand Face to face, everyone must give an account. It's a one by one judgment. You say that would take an eternity, time will be no more. It'll be a one by one. Every one of us will stand before him. Now remember, Jesus is God. He always has been God and always will be God. He's also man. Can you imagine the ministers of the gospel standing before him who knew the gospel, who preached a lie and lived a lie, who preached what they call the truth and lived a lie? I can't imagine any more agony worse than that. Can you imagine when Hitler stands before the throne? I don't know if there's going to be replay. When God somehow in the skies replays and the cries of five million Jews scream murderer God we want justice this is the man who tried to wipe our race from the earth how does a man any man 
even in body fitted for destruction, stand before a holy God in answer to that? How does the doctor stand there who boasts he has aborted 10,000 babies? Will we hear the wailing cry? Will the, will, will the masses there hear the wailing cry of 10,000 babies whose lives were snuffed? What are the millions of so-called believers who in the last days became lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God? Who turned away, the Bible said, like the swine who was clean and turned to its vomit and wallowed, turned to the mud and wallowed in the mud that he'd once been delivered from. Now, folks, it, it's impossible to picture all these scenes. I tried this past week to picture what it would be like just to... to to enhance my uh, righteous fear of God. To picture the torments and the cries. But folks, the context of Paul's message about the judgment seat of Christ has to do with believers. In fact, it's an amazing thing. He ties this whole scene into these very words. He ties it into judging our brothers and sisters. 14, verse 10, why dost thou judge thy brother? Why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. He's talking to real, born again, genuine Christians. We, Christians, must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And then he goes on, why do you judge your brother in light of this? Why do you reduce him to nothing? That's what it means to bring him to naught. Why would you reduce your brother or your sister to nothing? Why would you take away anything from your brother or sister, seeing that you're not the judge? He said, seeing that Jesus is the judge, that you, are, you and I are all going to stand before him. Who made you the judge? Who gave you the right and the permission to judge any brother or sister, no matter what they may be, or how, what they may look like or talk like? You... You have not been, you are not made the judge. He said, we shall all stand before God, not before you, not before me, but before the judge. I've been speculating with you what it might be like on the judgment day for people like Hitler and Stalin, the mass murderers and baby killers and, and the, the false prophet and the Antichrist, speculating what it may be like that. But Jesus would say, what is that to you? What is that to me? He said, what about your own heart? The issue is not what the world out there is going to do. The issue is not what Hitler's going to face. The issue is not what Mussolini is going to face. The issue is not what... The ungodly are going to face of the atheist. It's you, Christian. You, David Wilkerson. You are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And he ties this judgment into this issue of judging other believers. Why do you judge your brother or sister? What is there in your spirit so unyielded you can conjure something in your mind against a member of my body and reduce them to nothing? What is there in you still unyielded that you can conjure up what you think are spiritual vibes that you've received about a brother or sister? You say, I want God to search my heart. I want him to go deep, go deep, deep, deep. And I've been praying that all week and I didn't know he goes deep as he would. Because he's touched something in my life. And he wants to touch it in all of our lives because if God's going to walk among us and we're going to be a vessel of honor and glory to his name, he has to get to the bottom. We plead, O oh, Holy Ghost, purge us and cleanse us and go deeper with this. So now Paul does this, that, and he puts us right at the judgment seat of Christ, face to face with our master. Is there any mention here now of adultery or pornography? Or gambling, or drugs, or alcohol, or stealing, or any other kind of wickedness? Not at all. Not at all, because you see, this issue is even deeper than all of those sins. This is the root. And he said he did the axe to the root. 
It's easy and spectacular to talk about these sins that seem so powerful and so unusual, like drugs and alcohol, but all for the Christian world and for the church of Jesus Christ. God said, I have an issue that you must deal with before you come before my judgment. Folks, I've put myself before the judgment seat and have looked into my heart and I've got to cry, guilty, Lord. I judge others by sight. I judge them by outward appearance. I look at them and my mind says, he's hiding something. She's hiding something. He's too quiet. She's too quiet. I just know. How do I know? I don't. I think God's told me. No quiet. No laughing. See, mine is a spiritual judgment because the Bible doesn't say judge righteous judgment. Folks, we've got that so contorted. You know what that righteous judgment is? Self-judgment. It's Jesus saying, if you really want to be righteous in my sight, judge yourself. He's talking only about righteous judgment. He said, if you truly want to be righteous, you will let the Holy Spirit examine you and you will stand before the judgment seat. You will judge yourself that you be not judged. And he said, if we judge ourselves here, we will not be judged there. Isaiah said of Jesus, he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes. He will not reprove after the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness shall he judge. There's a well-known evangelist that took a fall, and he was a friend of mine. And three months before he fell, I... I uh, broke off relationship with him. And I uh, watched and listened in the news to all the reports. <clears throat> A year went by, two years went by. And I had so many minister friends, some of them well known. And I said, Brother Dave, <clears throat> have you felt led of the Lord to go visit Brother Zonzo? I said, no, I haven't. And it's probably because he's still in sin. In fact, I can't recall how many times pastor friends and others said, you were his friend. If, if, if you felt that the Lord to go and I'd say, well, no. And, and most other praying men that I know haven't been led to go see him. Other praying men identifying myself as a praying man. Absolute arrogance, unmitigated pride. Because I know for a fact the man doesn't sleep. And for all I know, he's been on his face weeping and crying out to God with everything in his gut. But you see, this holy man, this man of prayer, no, I can't go see him because, you see, I feel there's something wrong in his heart. He may still be living in sin. You see, I put, I, I, I instilled in everyone who talked to me about it, I implanted a seed in their mind. He's still living in sin. I have trembled when God fingered that. He said, if you want to see your heart, you want to see how proud you've been? Jesus said, you judge after the flesh, but I judge no man. And yet if I do judge, my judgment is true. You see, I want him to bring to light everything hidden in my heart. But God help me if I attempt to expose something I suppose is even somebody else's heart. God help me. But 
Go to 1 Corinthians 4. Starting verse 5. Therefore judge what? Nothing before the time until the Lord come. Who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. And then shall every man have praise of God. Judge nothing before the time until the Lord come. Uh, folks, I've got to get this out of my heart and folks, my knees are trembling. But I asked the Lord if I had to do this and the Lord said, yes, get it out. A number of years ago, a, a, a minister, an acquaintance came to me. Before I could stop him, told me a story of a pastor friend of mine who had, he said, had sinned grievously and it got into my spirit. And over the next four or five years, every time I saw that man, in my mind, he was stained by that word that I had received. I guess seven or eight years went by or longer. He came to one of my meetings. And there he was. And all I could I was preaching and looking and thinking all I can see is that sin. And I'm thinking, seven years and he's been in that sin. After the service, I said, Could you see? visit with me and I took him into a, a room, private room. I said, sit down. I got on my knees in front of him. And I said, listen, God's been dealing with you about a sin for a long time. It's got you enslaved. And I feel in my spirit you've got to repent. And he looked dumbfounded. I began to weep and said, please repent. I see a sin in your life. He got up. He said, David, this is crazy. You've crossed the line. I'm walking out on you. And when he left, I said, God, what was that all about? And he reminded me that those who had brought that report to me had brought a deceiving report previously. And then he said, David, the very thing that you accuse him of, you have the seed of that in your own heart. and You've had it a long time. You've been trying to get a speck out of his eye. And you've got a log in yours. I repented. And we're dear friends and he's never held it against me since. But you see, I, I judged him on something somebody had planted in my mind. Somebody planted it in my mind. And I still blush about it. I abhor what I did. I know it's under the blood. I want you to go to James. I've never trembled in preaching like this any in my lifetime. Chapter two. Verse begin at verse twelve. So speak ye and so do, as they that shall be judged. By the law of liberty, for he shall have judgment without mercy, that has shown no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. Now look at me, please. I told you that for, for weeks God's been walking among us in a holy awe of reverence. 
a, a, a just an awesome silence that, that we can't break and don't want to break. We don't know what to do when it comes but to repent and humble ourselves before the Lord. But you see, in this time, he's revealing his holiness. And that's why in this time of holy dealing by the Holy Spirit, these verses have been made real to me. Judged by the law of liberty. You see, you and I are in the new covenant. We enjoy the glorious promises of God, what he's promised to do to those, for those who repent. To put the fear of God into our heart, to cause us to walk in his ways. And to send the Holy Ghost to do in us what we are not capable of doing. Because we've repented and we've hungered and thirsted after Him. And He came and answered our cry. You see, to those, obedience is not a burden anymore. It becomes a joy. And you're no longer judged by thunder. You're no longer judged by thou shalt or thou shalt not. You're judged. You, you, you have in your heart a love for Jesus. And the greatest concern is not, well, you know, what can I do that's right or what can I do that's wrong? It's, if I do that, am I going to grieve him who has given me liberty and set me free? There's a liberty in my heart I enjoy now. The Lord has done such a work in my heart. Now, how can I grieve him if I do this? I don't want to do anything that is not going to make me all pleasing unto the Lord. So, though we're not judged by the law, we're judged by a higher law, the law of liberty. No one else can judge you now on your outward appearance. No one can judge you legally before the Lord. But you see, if you're walking in the law of liberty, if you're under the new covenant, and you know you're forgiven and you're walking in His mercy and grace, then this higher law is the law that rules your life. It governs you. When you open yourself to the Word of God and everything you read, you absorb it and you love it and say, I will obey because I love Him. Because He's delivered me from the power and corruption of sin. I'm compelled by the law of liberty in Jesus Christ to judge myself in the matter of modesty. I'm going to move now away from judging my brother and my sister to this matter of Holy Ghost modesty and chastity. Paul told Titus to speak to the church. He, he says, tell them to be sober and grave or serious about the things of God. And as a behavior as becometh holiness. We need behavior in the house, Paul said, that becomes holiness. And to the women... Tell them to be discreet and chaste. That means clean and pure. That the word of God be not blasphemed. I believe that God's people, if they're a holy people, are self-judging people. They don't need somebody in the pulpit haranguing. They don't need somebody pointing a finger saying, Thou shalt or thou shalt not, because there's a law of love and liberty in their heart. And they are moved quickly by the word of the Lord. They are moved by the hand of the Spirit and by His wooing. They, they see something in the word and the Lord says, Will you judge yourself now because you love me? <coughs> Will you go to the judgment seat now and judge yourself? In the Old Testament, Moses gave explicit directions on how to keep the camp clean. For the Lord thy God walks in the midst of your camp. To deliver you. To give up your enemies before you. Therefore, shall your camp be holy, that he see no unclean thing in it, and turn away from thee. No, we're not being judged by the law of Moses, but by a higher law. And especially when God's walking in the camp. <coughs> he said, if you want your enemies... Every enemy out of hell, every demon power to be subjected. You want to be totally delivered from the power of sin and lust. I'm walking in your midst and he said, I want it to be holy. I want everything in modesty and chastity as I walk in your midst. Not by the law of Moses, but the law of liberty. 
we had a, I'm going to talk about appearances and dress. No amens, please. Or holy ground. <clears throat> we had a young actress used to come to this church when we first started this uh, church a number of years ago. Excuse me. Dressed very sensually. In fact, she dressed here in church. She came to church as she dressed in the studio and as, as she was on the street and so forth. She, but nobody shamed her. Nobody talked to her. And, and I was so glad nobody rebuked her, told her that she was dressed unseemly. But we prayed and the Holy Spirit dealt with her. Just dealt with her. And she started coming to church dressed very modestly. <clears throat> and she told someone later, she said, you know, I didn't know. I just didn't know. I see men coming into this church with just muscle shirts. You know, flexing muscles. But, folks, we don't condemn. When you come to this church, nobody gives you a, a book of rules concerning a code book of dress and appearance. And I'll say something else. If, if somebody comes up to you and says something unloving about the way you dress, they don't represent the pastors of the church. They don't represent us at all. But you see, God's walking in the camp. The Holy Spirit is coming. Jesus is walking among us. Having said that about not putting the finger, not coming up and judging you as an individual. I'm not even judging you as a pastor. And I, I would hope that Anybody that's been coming to this church and you look at somebody coming in here with shorts or short shorts or dressed with a halter or whatever it may be. Whatever you ever said, it better be the Lord and it better be love. It can't be like the woman who came up to one young lady and says, look, <clears throat> your dress is too short. And if you don't have the money, I'll buy you one. It, it, was, it was absolutely embarrassing to the young lady. You had better be walking in the Spirit. But having said that, let me say this. If you really love Jesus, you hunger to be cleansed and to be His witness, you're going to take a good look at the way you talk and dress and judge yourself by the Word of the Lord and by the wooing of the Holy Spirit. You will judge yourself. I'm going to say this. Tight, revealing clothes in the presence of God is immodest. It's immodesty. It's not modest at all. Showing off your body is unchaste. Sensuous motions doing worship or evil. Sensuous m movements. At Mount Zion Bible School, <clears throat> young men don't run around in classes or chapel with muscle shirts. And the girls, when they walk the campus, tie a sweater around their waist. Legalism? No. Because there's a purpose. And I'll tell you, these young people thank us over and over and over again. Thank you for these standards. It's not legalism. We have two years to teach these children, these young people, to keep their eyes on Jesus and not be distracted by flesh. The young ladies thank us. The young men especially thank us. It's not legalism. It's God walking on that campus. There's a holiness. You walk on that campus, you recognize the presence of God immediately. Not because of the standard, but because their eyes are not distracted. Their eyes are on the Lord. I wondered this past week when I was praying about this message, if there's really replay... And what would it be like for a, a, a man who claims to be a true follower of Jesus and he stands before the throne and suddenly there's replay of every time he's watched a woman coming at him and turned and watched her go the other direction. He's looking and he's still looking. And what if the Lord, sir, if he plays every time you did that, suddenly thousands upon thousands of those appear all of a sudden. When Jesus said, if you even look on a woman, the lust you've committed adultery. 
Often, I, I, I wonder too about replay for women. Would you be able to stand before the throne and have replay without even your knowing because of the way of your, the, 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 the immodest dress? And suddenly, you, it becomes a surprise to you. Maybe it's not a surprise, but there it is. And you see men looking everywhere. The replay shows men turning, looking at you, following you right down the street, everywhere you go, on the job, and even occasionally in church. How do you take that? How do you stand before that scene? You see, I'm painting that scene now so that you can bring yourself to the judgment seat and deal with it. And judge yourself on it about how you come into the house of God. I wouldn't want to stand before God ever knowing that what I say or how I dress is detracted from Jesus. That eyes have been on me rather than who I am in Christ. Now, I'm going to give you the, the hope. God has made a way for us to stand before the judgment seat totally unashamed. Hallelujah. Folks, if it weren't for that, we, we would have no standing whatsoever. Thank God for the covenant. Thank God for the blood of Jesus. Here's the scripture I give you. Now, little children, abide in him that when he shall appear... We may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. That word ashamed is shrinking back. He said it's possible to have a people that on the judgment day, when the trumpet sound, we all appear before the Lord Jesus Christ. There will be a host that will not shrink back. They will not be ashamed and they stand there with confidence. Because they have come to the word, they've come already to the judgment seat, they've already been there. And they've judged themselves by His Word, by His Spirit. And He said, now you stand with, a, with confidence. You stand unashamedly. You stand with confidence. First John four seventeen. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment. Boldness in the day of judgment. Because as He is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casteth out fear. And let me tell you, God knows exactly when you have trusted His Word. He knows exactly when you've come to the blood and trusted in the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. He knows that moment when there's been honest repentance. And He says, now that you've repented, now that you've seen it, now that you've judged it, come now to the fountain of blood. Come to Jesus. Come to the cross. Accept your forgiveness. And now let joy flood in your heart. And let it be known to the whole world. And God says, as I was in the world, so are you. You're as clean as Jesus was as He walked this face when you come to the blood and believe for His forgiveness. Because you've repented of your sin. You've come to the judgment seat and you've judged yourself. He says, now you will not be judged. And there's freedom. And there's joy in the Holy Ghost. Here's love made perfect. If you've truly repented, truly repented, your next step is to come now by faith and believe that all is well with your soul. All is well with your soul. You see, my past, I, I told you about the arrogance and pride the Lord showed me in my heart. But you see, that's all under the blood now. I'm not judged by that anymore. I'm free. I don't know where he takes me from here. But folks, if you have a dealing in your heart right now, I asked the Lord what to do after I preached this message. <clears throat> and here's what he told me.
And I have, I don't remember being so severely dealt with on these matters and issues as I have this past week. I had no idea there was such an arrogance and such a pride harbored in my soul. Never saw it. Not in the degree that I see it now. I would see it at times that just pass on. Just as he showed me after I misjudged my friend. He showed me then, but it just didn't sink in. I thought, well, that's a one-time thing. But no, it became a part of my nature. Now, if you're here this morning in the annex, upstairs and here, in front of me, behind me, <clears throat> if you have to acknowledge, as you sit here, that you have misjudged your brothers or sisters, and if you have a tendency in you, see, I'm a suspicious person by nature. I'm suspicious. God help me. I, I've had to deal with that all my life. Early, early Pentecostalism was much that way. It was implanted. People going around correcting everybody. People going around saying, I see this, I see that about you. And it's been in my nature and I've asked God to take it out. <clears throat> now God does have... Righteous judgments that he, he, he sets up in the church. The leaders have to obey the Holy Spirit when he speaks. He has ways to deal with us. These are legal, biblical ways he deals with the church through elders and through ministers. But not as individuals. Only in corporate confidence. But if you're here, you have to repent. I'm going to ask you in just a moment to stand. And put yourself at the judgment seat of Christ. And judge yourself today. If you have to say, Brother David, the Holy Spirit's put his finger on my life. I've not been as cautious as I should be about the way I talk and dress. Because I know he's walking among us. And I want things to be right before him. I want my heart to be judged now. Upstairs, downstairs, and in the, in the annex, I want you to stand. Just humbly stand before the Lord. So that's me. The message was for me. Lord, I humble myself. I want to judge myself righteously before the Lord. You don't need to stand. No one will embarrass you by you remain seated. It has to be a work of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't mean anything. Now, if you're here this morning and, and you are not right with God, you don't know Jesus, and you've been backslidden, you've turned away, you can stand right now with these that are standing, and you can come right now to repentance. You can come to Jesus with all of your heart. I want you to stand in the presence of the Lord. I want you to lift both hands. And I want you to speak it out to Him, maybe privately or quietly. I want it to go deep into your heart. Lord, forgive me. Right now, ask forgiveness. God, forgive me. I judge myself. Come on, come to the throne. Lord Jesus, we come to your throne of grace and mercy right now. We're not standing before the judgment seat of Christ Literally, but we're standing spiritually right now before your judgment seat. You said if we judge ourselves, we shall not be judged. Lord, I've judged myself and I declare that I am guilty. I am guilty, Lord, of gossip. I am guilty of defaming my brothers and sisters. I'm guilty of suspicion. I'm guilty of so many things, Lord, that I, I thought were spiritual and they were my flesh. Oh, God, I've judged by appearances. I place myself before the judgment seat and I declare myself guilty before God. 
Just say it, Lord, I'm guilty. I am guilty, Lord. I am guilty before you, and I repent. I repent. God, I repent before you. I repent before this people. I repent before you, O oh God. And I tell you, there's a godly sorrow in my heart, and I need more than repentance. I need the power of the Holy Ghost to keep me from doing it again. I need to be reminded every time I even think this way. I need to be reminded by the Holy Ghost. Holy Spirit, come right now. Cleanse this body. Lord, for those who have to honestly admit, I've not been thinking about my dress as I should. I've not been thinking about it. Lord, there are many that are are totally innocent because they didn't even know. But now, Holy Spirit, as you're walking among us, you're saying it has to change. You have to think of these things. You've got to think about others looking. And you have to make sure you're not distracting from my presence. I walk among you and I can't walk among sensuality. I can't walk among immodesty. I can't walk among those who are unchaste when they know better and when the Holy Ghost has said lovingly, deal with it. Lord, we deal with it now in your holy presence. We deal with it. Hallelujah. Lord, forgive us. Folks, we need to repent before a holy God. We need to repent before a holy God that he would dig out the trash. Dig it out, Lord. You, you want to walk among a clean camp. It's not our righteousness, but it's yours. It's yours, Lord. But you're showing us things that have to be dealt with, oh God. Not to become righteous, but because we are righteous. We deal with these things in your love, oh God. Hallelujah. That we may be all pleasing in your sight. That we may not be a distraction to the things of this world. And that the glory of God be not defamed. Hallelujah. No, thank Him for forgiveness. Just thank Him right now, Lord. I thank You for forgiving me. I thank You. I am clean by the blood of Jesus. I am clean by the blood of the Lamb. (laughs) Folks, before I, I would close, I have to say this. I speak of the extreme on one side and there's another extreme. And that's the dress of the Pharisee who, who dresses to make a statement that says, I'm holy. And there are people today in the church who say, look at my unbraided hair. And men who say, look at my black suit and my black tie. And look at this forlorn face of mine and see how holy I am. It's the other side. And God hates that as much. He hates the hypocrisy of dressing to look holy just to make a statement to be holier than thou. Oh, how God hates that. Put on a long face and rub the eyes so people would see I'm fasting. No, no, no. This there's such a churning in my inner man. Because, folks, it's an awesome thing to come under the law of liberty. Because there's a chastening, he said, goes with it. And that chastening is when God begins to deal with it. You see the blackness of your heart. You see these things that you just danced over. And he begins to show you. And It hurts. But oh, the healing power that comes with that, the grace of God, the glory that follows that when you're truly repented before the Lord. Now, here's what we're going to do. We have an annex. Now, those in the annex, you're facing room 206. Now, God's dealing with you in a supernatural way, and the Holy Ghost is willing to say, you need to get on your knees. I want you to just go right into room 206. And if you don't know the Lord, if you're backslidden, Go into room 206 and just get on your knees. And we've got some prayer monitors and helpers just just there to answer, uh, to pray with you. And here in this auditorium, upstairs and downstairs, if you just right now, I'm going to ask Pastor Carter to lead us in a worship song. And as we sing this chorus, if the Holy Spirit, maybe you're visiting here. And folks, we used to give visitors a book and a tape and some refreshments. But we've canceled all that. In fact, we've canceled all, all special meetings. We've canceled everything. 
till the all the rest of this year. All special meetings, all speakers, everything's been canceled. Because we're here to seek God. In the last two weeks we've been meeting almost every night except Monday and Friday. Or Monday and, and Saturday. This next week we will be meeting only Tuesday and Friday. And if the Lord says do that, we'll do that. But if, if you are here now, I'm not going to give you a book or tape today. The best thing we can give you from now on, you visit Times Square Church, you moved on by the Holy Spirit. You see, we got, we got serious about God in this church. We got serious about sin. We're serious about reverence in His face. And when you come to the church anymore, there's no talking. There's no visiting. And we leave with that awe and that reverence. Because a holy God's walking in our midst. And if you've been truly convicted by the Holy Spirit, we don't take your name, you can't join anything, we don't have a membership. But if you're sincere and there's a soberness that God's put in your heart, God's lovingly pointing a finger. Nobody railed at you today. You say, oh, Pastor Dave, I, I don't want to leave Times Square Church until I've had a chance to unburden my heart to the Lord. I want to talk to Him. Just get out of your seat right now. We say, and go to the lobby. Uh, usher, will you please direct them upstairs and then right through into the other building. Go to room 206. The ushers are there all along the way and they'll show you the way. Husbands, wives, maybe a whole family. You can go together wherever you're at. Just slip out right now. Slip right out of your seat. People will let you out as we sing this. We don't count heads. We're not trying to pack. We may not have anybody at this altar right now. But you, you, you go as the Spirit draws you. If it's not the work of the Holy Spirit, it's not going to last. Heavenly Father, find every hungry heart in this building, in, in the annex, Lord. Draw people into room 206. Draw people from this auditorium into room 206. Because there, Lord Jesus, you wait there. You wait there with open arms to forgive and cleanse and to restore that which has been eaten by the devil. Everything that's been lost, you restore all the years the canker worm has eaten. In the name of Jesus.